Good day, everyone. To better understand capital asset pricing model, I have here some samples and illustrations. Now, if we know the risk as measured by beta of a particular share, we can use the capital asset pricing model to determine that securities required rate of return. So, as per definition, Capital asset pricing model, known as CAPM, is a model developed to help determine a share's required rate of return for a given level of risk. If an individual chooses to invest her money, then she must postpone consumption. Now, what rate of return would our investor demand just to postpone her consumption? right? Because here, we assume that the individual has money, okay? For example, you have 1,000 pesos, all right? And so what is the purpose of money? So, or okay, I think we would agree that we use money to buy food for consumption. So if we are going to postpone that consumption, it means that we are going to invest it, right? So what rate of return would our investor demand just to postpone her consumption, okay? So we impl implicitly assume the investor takes a no risk whatsoever, but merely postpones consumptions. So she will want compensa compensation for the weight plus an additional return for any inflationary measures or an inflation premium. So if our investor demands a 3% return to postpone consumption and another 2% to cover the expected rate of inflation, she would require a 5% rate of return. That is, the risk-free rate of return is 5%. For now, let us put her funds into a riskless security that pays a 5% rate of return. So we tend to think of treasury securities, right, as a good proxy for a riskless asset because there is no default risk. Okay, so here's the formula. So required rate of return is equal to the risk-free rate, okay? So in our example, right? So as I have said, an individual, okay? An individual or an investor demands a 3% return to postpone consumption, okay? So let's say she has 1,000 pesos. All right, and she will not consume that 1,000 pesos, but she demands a 3% return for that and another 2% to cover the expected rate of inflation, okay? So the required rate of return is 3% plus 2% is 5%. That is for the risk-free rate of return. So for our example, the required rate of return for the investor is 5%. Okay. Now, what would it take to get our investor to move from a risk-free asset to a risky asset? So that would depend on the quantity of risk or beta the asset had and what price our investor charges for risk. So this is now the formula. So additional compensation required for investment in a risky asset is equal to the price per unit of risk times the beta. We measure the price of risk as the difference between the rate of return on the market 
as measured by the rate of return on the S&P 500 index and the risk-free rate of return. So, price per unit of risk is equal to the return on the market minus the risk-free rate. Now, we can measure the quantity of risk with a stock's beta coefficient. So recall that by definition, our riskless asset has a beta of zero. And the market has a beta coefficient equal to 1.0. The market, therefore, has one unit of risk, right? Because riskless asset has a beta of zero and the market has a beta coefficient equal to one. So the market has one unit of risk. So if we have multiply the price of risk times the beta, we can determine what our investor is charging per unit of risk. So there's the formula. The additional compensation required for investment in a risky asset is equal to the price per unit of risk multiplied by the beta. Now, the required rate of return on the security is computed as this one. So, required rate of return is equal to the risk-free rate plus the quantity return on the market minus risk-free rate times beta, okay? So to better understand this one, let's have some illustrations, okay? So here's the problem. Suppose a particular stock has a risk-free rate of 5%, a rate of return on the market of 12%, and a beta, so that is the quantity of risk of 1.5. So what would be the investor's required rate of return? Okay? So the required rate of return is equal to the risk-free rate of return plus price of risk times beta. So the additional return needed to induce our investor to move from a risk-free investment that has zero units of risk, okay, to an investment that has one and a half units of risk, okay? Because our beta here is 1.5. And take note that a risk-free investment has a beta of zero. That means that this investment has one and a half unit of risk. So the required rate of return is, okay, with this formula, okay, 5%. So this is the risk free rate plus the quantity return on the market, return on the market of 12% minus the risk free rate which is 5%, okay, and multiply that by 1.5. So you deduct this first, 12% minus 5%, you multiply that by 1.5, and then you'd add that to 5%. So the required rate of return is 15.5%. Another illustration, okay, this one. JD Company has a beta coefficient of 1.6. The current rate of return on treasury securities is 9%. The analyst estimates the return on the market portfolio to be 13.5. Uh, to be 13%, okay? So 
a beta coefficient of 1.6, return on treasury security of 9%, and market portfolio of 13%. So first question, what rate of return will an investor require to invest in a risk-free asset? Okay, take note, risk-free asset. So the answer is 9%, okay, 9% because treasury securities are risk-free assets. Next. What components make up the risk-free rate of return? Now, real rate of interest, that is the rate of return it takes to get investors to postpone consumption plus an inflation premium to protect the investor against rising price levels. Okay. Next. What is the price per unit of risk or beta? Okay. So the price per unit of risk is 4%. Okay. So that's 13% the market portfolio minus 9%. So that's equal to 4%. Okay. Next, what is the quantity of risk or beta? So it's 1.6 units. Okay, next. What rate of return will an investor require to invest in JD company? So the required rate of return is equal to 9% plus the quantity 13% minus 9% multiplied by the beta coefficient of 1.6, okay? So 13 minus nine times 1.6 plus 9%, that's equal to 15.4%. So that is the rate of return, required rate of return, okay? Another question. What additional return did an investor require to move from a risk-free asset with zero units of risk to an asset that has 1.6 units of risk, okay? So additional return needed to induce an investor to move from the risk-free asset to an asset that has 1.6 unit of risk is equal to the quantity 13% minus 9% multiplied by beta, which is 1.6. So that is 6.4%, okay? So here, this one. Without doing any calculations, what do you think would happen to our investors' required rate of return if the quantity of risk went from 1.6 units to 2.4 units, all right? So without calculations, okay? We are just... Uh, we're just going to explain our logic, okay, in words only. So, our investor would require a greater rate of return to compensate for the additional risk. Now, recall we assume that all rational investors are risk averse. This means that investors 
do not like risk. And if we want an investor to take on more risk, so we have to offer inducements or higher returns. Okay. Next. All right. So what rate of return would an investor require if the amount of risk increased from 1.6 units to 2.4 units? Okay, so the risk, the amount of risk is increased. Right. So using the formula, the required rate of return would be 18.6%. So that is 9% plus the quantity 13% minus 9% multiplied by 2.4. That's equal to 18.6%. Okay. So take note that here from the original example, the beta coefficient is 1.6. And the required rate of return for that was 15.4%. So with the increase of risk from 1.6 to 2.4%, the required rate of return has also increased from 15.4% to 18.6%. So the higher the risk, the higher the return. Right. Okay. Right? Okay, thank you so much for uh, watching this video. I hope that by now you have a clear understanding of the capital asset pricing model. Okay, have a nice day.